All right, well, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Come on, we can do better than that for all the dads in the house. Not only for the dads in the house, but the dads that may not be in the house right now, but all the dads online as well. We certainly want to welcome and celebrate all of the fathers. And uh, it's uh, just a great day to celebrate because it's the only day that we dads get, so we're going to take it. All right, this is it right here. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Thank you so much for saying happy birthday. It, it, yeah, I know. I've had, uh, I've had, uh, yeah, well, anyways, thank you so much. <laughs> i just leave it there. Let's open up with a word of prayer here this morning. And I hope you're getting ready to celebrate with dads or the father, the father figure in your life, either way. You know, this is a, a day of celebrating. You know, every day is a day of celebrating. Amen? It really is. So let's look at some of these things that I have to, to share with you this morning. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. You are the Father of fathers. And Lord, to every man here, Lord, echoes out uh, a sentiment, Father God, that comes from your heart. And that, Father, you rejoice in the fatherhood of a man. A day to honor fatherhood. A day to celebrate the impact of these fathers and these men that are becoming fathers and being groomed to become fathers to make a difference in society. And Lord, I want to thank you that you are leading and guiding us even in this service. Give us ears to hear, Father God, and a heart to receive and understand so that we might apply your word to our lives. And everyone in agreement said, amen, amen. Um, again, I want to celebrate all the dads and you know, I said earlier, I don't know if you picked it up when I uh, gave that greeting. It was actually uh, going out to the, uh, the campuses and church plants. And um, we decided to kind of show it here. But um, Father's Day is a, is a great day. Let me speak to the fathers for a second. But I don't just speak to the fathers. I want to also speak to, to um, the men in the house. And it doesn't exclude uh, women uh, at all in the sense of the principle of what I'm going to be sharing with you. But really, it's, it's good to celebrate days like this. It kind of reminds us of our responsibility and what God has called us to do, how he's positioned us. But also, he wants to see it biblically. Your choices can make a real big difference in your life. But it was um, a great minister, T.D. Jakes, who once said, um, I want to congratulate all men out there that are working diligently to be good fathers, whether they are uh, stepfathers, biological fathers, father figures, um, or spiritual fathers. Keep doing that good work for your children. Our society needs quality fathers expecting their children to do great things. And I'm sure all the dads here in this room um, um, are, are desiring that. But it was Billy Graham who said, that kind of struck a chord with me that I'd like to share with you uh, this morning, where he said, no father is perfect. Well, can I have an amen on that one? Anyways, and he goes on to say, and every father is growing through the process. As long as we're desiring to learn in any area of our life, there's growth to be had, amen? And then uh, the statement that you might have not caught that uh, Pastor Frank uh, Pittman once said, he said, uh, fathering is not something uh, perfect men do, but something that perfects the man. And I just wanna say a hearty hallelujah. That is so true. And um, I have beautiful daughters, Thank you, Jesus. And, um, and uh, they've, they've all had their, their uh, we've all had our um, um, moments of growing together. Is that a nice way of saying it? I'm trying to be diplomatic here. And, uh, and it's been great. But I want to also talk about all of us fathers and men, and I do want to just listen in. There's something for you to all to receive. There's a process. There's a process in, in growth, being rooted and grounded, being willing to be open, being willing to be uh, changed. You know, nothing is set in motion. Sometimes we think that because we're a male, we're a man. But you could be a male and never live in your manhood. And so I want to look at some things that we want to see from the Word of God. First, let's go to James 1.17 from the Amplified. It says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the from the Father of lights, the creator and the sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising or setting, or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. 
One translation says, the father doesn't change like the shifting shadows produced by the sun and the moon. He is consistent, he is unfailing, he is faithful, he is unchangeable, and he is powerful. Can I have an amen? amen. Our heavenly father, I think no one would argue this at all, is our perfect father. So no matter where you're coming from, you know, whether you think this has all worked out or some things haven't worked out, you know, I want you to understand, you have never been, now that you're born again, you are not fatherless. You are fatherful. Meaning you have the fullness of the father working on your behalf. That might seem like a strange statement, but let me address a very, very important group of people in this society, which are our men and our fathers. You ladies, you can just listen in, but I'm sure you're going to receive something. You know, real fatherhood begins with the with a kingdom-centered man. And let me define what I refer to as a kingdom-centered man. A male who makes the quality decision to operate consistently under the governance of God's rule and order, his righteousness through the lordship of Jesus Christ and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You know, fulfilling our role as a father is so important. You can't really fulfill your role until you understand your role as a man. And it's important that manhood is preparation for fatherhood and fatherhood is an outcome of manhood. But in all that being said, why I share this, because you ladies better be wise on how you pick them. If you're single, that is. <laughs> Don't try to pick. <laughs> I won't go there. Help me, Jesus. Amen. But, uh, you know, our choices in any part of life our choices have consequences they really do and sometimes we can let our emotions get in the way of our right choices and we need to realize that if there's ever been a time a critical time that our understanding of as god designed it as god has you designed as a man and even as a father is more important, it would be this time now. We need to make it clear for ourselves, to make it clear for our families, to make it clear for society. You know, because here's where you need to, you have to either stand up or sit down, speak up or remain silent, commit or conform, you know, conquer or cave in, be bold or bow down, do what's right or just do what's easy. It's time for the clarity to come back to the house it's time for clarity to come back to your life. You know, double-mindedness makes you unstable in all areas of your life. Let not that double-minded man think that he is stable, the Bible says. You know, and um, this is where God wants us to be settled. Say, today we're going to settle it. I heard a story of a family that took a, a, a trip on a Father's Day. The father wanted to go to the country, so they went to the country. And uh, one day... On that trip, he had to correct the son who was um, acting up. And you see, what had happened is that the son had gone uh, outside uh, to the outhouse. And this really irritated the son. Why? Because they were in the country. It was a rural area. They didn't have indoor plumbing, but it was beautiful. But they had an outhouse. If you don't know what an outhouse is, look it up on Google. Anyways, and um, it's an outdoor facility. Yeah. Porter party in the, in the rural sense of the word. Anyways, and this young man was just really irritated because he was a city boy. You know, he felt like it was below him. But after all, what are you going to do, right? And um, he just was getting so irritated, so irritated, so irritated, so frustrated that, uh, you know, he decided to go out there. You know, this just isn't right. We, we shouldn't even be here. We, we should be where the, where the lights are, where, the, where there's indoor plumbing at least. And so he went outside and he... And he pushed over the outhouse and it fell into a creek that was right next to the outhouse. And then he realized what he had done. He's like, oh my gosh, you know, and he ran off. He just ran off because he didn't want anybody to see him. As he looked around, nobody was there, not his mother, not his father, not the siblings. And, um, and then the next day the father said, son, could you come over here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did you push over that outhouse into the creek the other day? He says, well, um, well, yeah, to be honest with you, I, I, I did. Well, I want you to understand that's not how you treat other people's property, and I'm going to have to bring some correction to you, and I hope you understand that this is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. And he says, I don't think so, because he brought out, 
you know, the paddle stick. He was going to get paddled in the behind. Some of you don't even know what that is. You need to learn what it is. And um, <laughs> nevertheless, and so uh, the son said, wait, 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 before you take another step, let me bring something to your attention. Wasn't it George Washington who cut down the cherry tree? And, but he was honest with his father. Do you see anything written that his father gave him spankings? You know, because he cut down the cherry tree. He was honest. Aren't I being honest with you, Dad? And he says, yeah, that's true. His father did spank him, but George Washington's father wasn't in the cherry tree. See, what I'm trying to share with you is, some of you got it, you know, dad was in the outhouse when the boy got upset and pushed it over the creek. Yeah. And so obviously the son didn't think this thing all the way through. A young man made a bad decision because he did not understand the full scope of the situation. Said another way, choices have consequences. Amen. Choices have consequences. Let me share something with you that uh, Edwin Lewis Cole once said. Um, he said, temptation can be tormenting, but remember the torment of temptation to sin is nothing compared to the torment of the consequences of sin. Remorse and regret cannot compensate for sin. Though sins can be forgiven immediately, the consequences can last a lifetime. It wasn't uh, but a well, about a year ago or so, I was driving down the street. And I saw this little church, only by the, I say small, um, only by the size of it. Uh, and it had a little, you know, poster on the outside. And it had a little sign. And I wrote down what it, what it said because it caught my attention. And the Lord really ministered to me out of that. And it said this. It says, you are absolutely free to choose, but you are not free from the consequences of your choice. You know, I am talking to men, but I'm talking to all of us now. Choices in our life have to be made. Right now, you need to choose who you will live for, what you will stand for, and, um, and the list goes on in that area. And sometimes we come to this place where there seems to be, you know, what they call a fork in the road. The fork in the road means that you come to this place, there's two roads that go two different directions seemingly, and um, oftentimes that's where you find yourself, no matter who you are, whether you're an adult, whether you're a child, uh, whether you're a parent, on a number of different situations. Kind of reminds me of the Alice in Wonderland story that I've oftentimes shared, where she comes in the story of Alice in Wonderland, she comes to a fork in the road, and sitting right there in between that fork is the Cheshire Cat, you know? And he's just kind of up there with that, that hideous grin. Anyways, um, and you know, Alice basically asks a question that many people are asking even today in our society, which way do I go? So we ask, she asks the cat, you know, which road do I take? And the Cheshire said, well, that all depends where you want to go. And uh, Alice responded, well, I really don't know. Well, then the Cheshire cat says, well, then it really doesn't matter, does it? See, oftentimes when you're not clear on your direction in life, on your pursuit in life, you end up with these narratives and the consequences of the choice that you made because you weren't clear from the beginning. We need to learn to make decisions, quality decisions. A quality decision uh, is what ignites dedication because dedication is formed by decisions of quality. You know, it's important that, that we heard this, uh, wasn't a, but a few years ago, I remember saving, I got a hold of it, Something that uh, Brother Copeland um, once said that I'd like to share with you when he's talking about uh, making quality decisions. He said, a time will come in your life when you will face commitment. How you handle it may well determine whether you succeed or fail, even whether you live or die. If you are not willing to face commitment in spite of emergencies and opposition, then take the time to get before God and study his word until the Holy Spirit and you deal with your willingness to be committed. He goes on to say, when you finally make a full no quit, no turn back, forever commitment to God, fulfilling, he was talking about the call on your life or to one of God's promises. He says, um, your calling will be the most exciting thing that you've ever done. 
an expectation will rise up. But until you, till the issue is forever settled in your mind and in your heart, you will have hell on earth to deal with. Satan will torment you unmercifully in your double-mindedness. Don't ever be afraid to accept responsibility of making a quality decision. God has provided the power, furnished the weapons, equipped you with everything you need. It is the same as experiencing the new birth or being born again. Once you made the decision, God did the rest. His power, his Holy Spirit, his word performed their functions and you were born again. A decision is all it took. All you must do is determine in your heart to obey your calling, to obey God's word, and God will do his part. Never, never, never be deceived by thinking that being in the will of God is the most expensive thing, most expensive thing in your life. The most costly thing on this planet is being out of the will of God, and that you cannot afford. Great insight, a man of great experience. So what kind of choice are we having to make? What kind of choice affects our families and our society today? Well, for men, I want to speak to you. It's a choice of acting like a man. Paul the Apostle said, act like a man. One translation says, act like mature men. Another translation says, you know, um, show that you are men. Another translation just simply says, be men. Now, this is not a gender slanted message. Rather, it's about making quality decisions, not only on what God has called you to do, but how he's called you to live. See, the reality is God is wanting men, and even our fathers here, to make the choice to act like men. One precedes the other. So important. All young men need examples in our society. Our culture is being shaped by examples, examples, list, list, forget it, by the lack of examples that we have in fathering and also just in being men every day. You young men, you're in your 20s or you're in your 30s and you're not married yet, you are examples. You need to understand, you need to learn to act like a man, not like a wimp. Oh, sorry, that just came out. Anyways, um, God is waiting for on a man or fathers to choose him, not just to use, you know, pretty ritualistic words that have no meaning in your heart. God speaks heart and he listens to your heart, not just a set of pretty words. You know, it's important that you and I understand one translation actually says of 1 Corinthians, what is it, 16, 13, it says, keep your eyes open Hold tight on your convictions. Give it all you've got. Act like a man. Be resolute. Love without stopping. I want to talk to you about that for just a second. Because, for example, there was a man that you all have heard about. His name was Joshua. He had to make a decision when it wasn't popular. Yes, he was the leader of Israel after Moses had died. They had great conquest, great prosperity, great victory. You know, it would be in, um, it seemed to be the best of times, you know, for, for them because so many conquests had come in, but something had begun to sneak in, compromise amongst the people of Israel. And so Joshua just had to settle it. And he settled it this way when he made this statement. In verse 14 of Joshua 24, he says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Uh, and put away all the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. I want you to understand he was not asking what is the popular opinion. He says, this is my stance. You know, nobody says that making a quality decision as a man or a woman, you know, is easy. 
Quality decisions are not easy. They're just rarely made. And I want you to understand, nobody says that quality decisions are always simple, but they are necessary for you to be successful in your life. But it doesn't mean that you're always going to be popular as uh, Theodore Hesburgh, former president of Notre Dame, once stated. He said, you don't make decisions because they are easy. You don't make decisions because they are cheap. You don't make decisions because they are popular. You make decisions because they are right. And it's so important that you and I understand this simple truth. Because the Bible says every good gift bestowed, every perfect gift received comes from above. Courtesy of the Father of lights. The Father is consistent. He won't change his mind or play tricks in the shadows. God is saying, I'm not going to change. So stay focused. I'm always going to be there to supply you. I'm always going to be there to lift you up. You know, but what I like is what we sometimes, we fathers sometimes, and men, of course women as well, I'm sure, but we understand that we think, well, you know, I'm just too imperfect. You know, I've made too many mistakes. I've, you know, I've gone too far. But here, God is looking for someone to stand up in their imperfection. Your imperfections have never stopped God from doing a perfect work in a man that is willing. And here's what I want you to understand. The Bible literally says in 1 Corinthians 16, it says, be alert, be on guard, stand firm in your faith, your convictions. Act like men and be courageous, grow in strength. Let everything you do be done in love, motivated and inspired by the God, uh, by the love God has for us. Today, there are many men and women, but men who have surrendered meaning for mediocrity. They've surrendered uh, conviction for compromise. They've surrendered commitment for convenience. Because they have so many narratives in the sound of other people's narratives, you know, has made them unstable. But God is very clear. His word is true. His word is unfailing. His word is eternal. You know, the struggle of a man today has incited chaos in other areas of our life. It has incited chaos in families and marriages and society and our culture and our businesses and our finances, you know, by the refusal or the failure of males to become men, as God has defined it, it has created havoc in so many areas of our lives. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule, but the reality is when you look at the scope of the decline of the clarity within the home, within our society, and you just listen to the narratives outside the word of God, and you fall prey to that, it causes you to become unstable. It causes you, you know, to question, you know, your position, uh, your calling as a man, your calling as a father. You know, in Ezekiel 22, let me share it this way. The Bible says that God looked for a man to stand in the gap so that the, the, so that the land would not have to be destroyed, but he could not find a man. He found males. He just didn't find a man. In Jeremiah chapter 5, the same thing is said. Look, he looked for a man among the males, but he couldn't find a man. So what I'm sharing with you, listen now. It is possible to be a male and not act like a man. So here's what Edwin Lewis Cole once said. Being male is a matter of birth. Being a man is a matter of choice. See, maturity does not come with um with age but with the acceptance of responsibility you are only young once but in maturity can last a lifetime dr Evan lewis cole was a very wise man but let me share with you honestly why i think sometimes some of the fathers or men have kind of backed off or taken this neutral stance there is no neutral ground in the kingdom of god there is no neutral ground with your manhood. There is no neutral ground with you being a father. No one ever asked you, and God has never called you to be a perfect father because you're not. This is what I like what Billy Graham says. All fathers are imperfect, 
But as long as they're willing to be prophetic, that they're going to grow in the process of fatherhood. But sometimes when we feel that we've come short or dropped the ball or, you know, had uh, one too many scuffles in, in, in our fatherhood or in situations like that, we tend to become reclusive. We, can, we tend to back away. We tend to take more of a, of a neutral stance, and that is not your call. That is not what God has called you to do. God doesn't want you to live by remorse. He doesn't want you to live by regret. And some, sometimes we men, I'm going to help you out of this in just a second, but let me say that this way. Sometimes we just pack it in there. We just pack it in there, and it's what makes you frustrated. It's what makes you bitter. It's what gets you upset because, you, you know, you've packed in the shortcomings, but you never got rid of them. You see, you packed in the mistakes and feel bad about it. God is not the one who's trying to make you feel bad. God is not the one who's trying to condemn you. God is not the one who's calling you out and trying to shame you. But what we do is because we, uh, we don't understand that God is there to help us in our imperfections. If we would be open, he's the one who wants to perfect us. Who doesn't have a trail of imperfections? Who doesn't have a trail of miscalculations? Who doesn't have a trail of mistakes? Every person on the planet Earth does. And the enemy tries to turn that on you and make the narrative, oh, you're just not good enough. Oh, you just might, might as well back off. You better, not, you better not even try to stand up as a father or as a man. Who do you think you are? And so sometimes it's our imperfections or our mistakes or our mishits or our moments of crazy chaos that we've had in family situations. And we just think it's too late. And sometimes we bury that thought. Don't speak it. We bury that thought within us. And I want to share with you men or you uh, fathers here in this room, that this is a day to reignite your manhood and a day to reignite your fatherhood and to let God pour into you what you couldn't do for yourself outside the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? But I, I really want to help you to understand. See, this is what I have seen. Just kind of follow me because this is... This is where I, I've seen it in my own life. I had to work it through in, in my earlier life with a number of mistakes that I made as a father in my early fatherhood, even in my mid-range fatherhood. I'm sure I made mistakes that my daughters can all share with you. But one thing I do know, there is an unshakable source called the good, good father. And he, as long as you're open dads, as long as you're open men, you know, do not become reclusive. Do not back off. Do not lose your commitment. Do not lose your conviction. Do not lose your stance. But stand up in Christ. God is not shocked when you and I make mistakes. It's when you and I don't get rid of them. Burying them is not getting rid of them. Hiding them is not getting rid of them. Trying to run from them is not getting rid of them. Repenting of them and moving on so that it doesn't plague you anymore. And we're going to cut that plague off from every father, from every man in this room, in the name of Jesus. Amen? Because a lot of people, a lot of men, really they're imprisoned by regret. They're imprisoned by remorse. They're imprisoned by years of bitterness because they feel bad that they didn't come through or that something happened and it seems impossible to repair. And sometimes those things that we regret are the things that if we could go back, you know, We'd like to do it all over again. We would, and it would be different. But you can't repair the past, but you can make a decision right now that will affect your right now and your future. You see, for example, think of the case of, and there's plenty of them that I'll share with you in just a moment, patriarchs in the Bible like Moses. I mean, he, he took matters into his own hands, and he took what mattered out of God's hands, and he made a huge miscalculation, and I had a it came with a great price tag. But God is a God of the second chance. And 